All right, good evening and welcome to our Wu University Who's Who in Glaucoma series. Tonight we have with us Dr. Elizabeth Muckley and she's presenting on the nuts and bolts of interpreting the visual field in glaucoma and what do I really need to know. So I'm your host, Dr. Ariel Serenzi, and I'll be helping moderate tonight's event. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, she is in Northeast Ohio, in Kent, Ohio, and she is the Director of Optometric Services at Northeast Ohio Eye Surgeons with a concentration in glaucoma and post-operative care. Um, she has helped to expand the scope of practice for our Ohio optometrist as a uh, legislative chair and passed, helped pass three Ohio laws to ex expand the scope of practice. So thank you for that. That is amazing. <laughs> um, she was also recognized as AOA's Young Optometrist of the Year in 2008. Um, in 2021, she was Ohio's Optometrist of the Year. She's also authored a, the primary care of anterior segment textbook in the uh, glaucoma chapter, and just has a lot of great experience um, lecturing and writing on glaucoma. So we are so excited to hear from her tonight and are honored to have her on Woo You. So thank you, Dr. Muckley. Thank you, Dr. Serenzi. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. Um, and I thank Dr. Wu as well. I think this is a great platform. And I think it's wonderful to be able to uh, educate more optometrists on medical glaucoma. It's so important for us to embrace glaucoma in our practice. It's a great way to expand your specialties. So hopefully tonight we'll learn a little bit more about um, dual field testing. I have a few financial disclosures. Uh, nothing big. I'm an investor in my own practice and a uh, consultant for Allergan and a key opinion leader. So we'll get started tonight. If you have the handout, I always add things last minute, so it may not flow exactly like our, our uh, lecture, but it'll follow along pretty close. And I do like to put a lot of stuff on my slides so that you can take screenshots or, or write things down. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. I don't mind if you do that. All right, so it's really important that tonight we go through some technical things. I know sometimes understanding field testing and glaucoma testing can be pretty boring. I'm going to try to break it down so that we know what are the important features and the nuts and bolts of what we need to learn uh, in, in test interpretation and test selection and strategy for glaucoma, and importantly, how to understand the printouts. Uh, we'll look for uh, field loss associated with glaucoma. And if we get time, I have a few cases to show you at the end. So we're going to try to make complicated technology understandable and break it down so that uh, we can also uh, really use it and maximize um, testing so that we can evaluate for progression as well. So we know from glaucoma trials that, you know, as eyes progress, even in patients where pressures are, you know, within normal limits, we can still get progression. And we also know that rates of progression vary quite tremendously between patients. And sometimes you have a, a fast progressor and sometimes you have somebody who has glaucoma for 20 years and they barely progress. And it's very difficult sometimes to, you know, establish those rates and there's, there's no linear relationship. So our, our testing is really important in helping us establish that. It plays a real role, especially when we're trying to establish target pressures and does require series of field testing to get a better understanding of that rate of progression. Recommendation really is that visual field should be performed, you know, pretty frequently first few years after a patient's diagnosed. Um, the recommendation right now is about three fields per year for the first two years after diagnosis um, because patients a hard time taking the test. It's not easy. They have to get the hang of it. And um, you know, we have to know what's reliable, what's not reliable while we're trying to assess for progression. Um, this recommendation is way more frequent than what is truly common in clinical practice. Um, insurance only pays for so much sometimes, and we are you know, set within the bounds of insurance. But um, more frequent testing is really what we need to do in the beginning. And that's just one takeaway point tonight. 
it was over 30 years ago where uh, quickly found that 25 to 40% of the retinal nerve fibers in a region need to be damaged before you get that corresponding blind spot. And we know that glaucomatous loss first occurs in the vagerum areas, and it's going to follow that arcuate course uh, from the macula uh, ending at the temporal uh, rafe. So, you know, the pattern is very much mapping out those retinal ganglion uh, cells and fibers. So what is the boundaries of the, the field? And we've got, you know, the 60 degrees superior, 70 inferior. Um, we're only really testing the, the central 30 and we'll kind or the peripheral 30 and the central 10. We'll kind of explain why. Um, the most important thing to know is that we all have a visual threshold at every point. And the testing is going to look for the weakest stimulus um, matched to age-related norms. So we want to see how low you can go. You know, this was the old Goldman test long ago before we had automated perimetry. This is going to take you back to optometry school. Um, the hill of vision is the point of fixation uh, that has the, the, in the hill that has the highest sensitivity right in the center of the macula. Uh, weak stimulus that's visible will have uh, low thresholds. Um, so, you know, that kind of tells you that your strongest, brightest points are going to be at the macula. And then going out, we're going to have a rapid decrease, uh, you know, in the 10 degrees around fixation and then further out peripherally. Most of the retinal ganglion cells are within that first 30 degrees of fixation, which is why most of our field testing is just testing that 30 degrees and not testing out past that. And those are the cells that are first affected from glaucoma. Um, as the height of the hill, you know, is affected by your age, um, the lighting, the stimulus size, and the duration that the stimulus is shown. When we talk about field testing, visual field testing is either threshold or super threshold algorithms. And threshold testing is what we mostly do in glaucoma. Uh, the stimulus is seen and then we kind of bracket it down and dim it until you no longer see it. So how low can you go? What's the dimmest light you can see? And the goal is to measure this differential light sensitivity at each location. Super threshold, kind of has a predetermined brightness that's tested at each point. And the precise sensitivity of each test location is not known, but the goal is to establish whether that sensitivity is low at any point in the visual field. Um, it's really not used much um, in glaucoma care, but it might be easier for inexperienced patients or suspects or um, healthy patients where suspicion for field defects is low. These are really the threshold strategies for testing. Um, we have the full threshold, we have fast pack, we have CETA standard, CETA fast, CETA faster, we have a swap, a CETA swap, and we have newer devices. We have FDT and now virtual reality. So these are the common uh, automated primaries that you might um, experience. The purposes of what we're talking about tonight, we are gonna talk more focus specifically more on Humphrey because that is more your standard of care in glaucoma testing. Certainly there's other devices that do a lot for screening and also look at threshold, but when we talk glaucoma, most of it is through the Humphrey platforms. But we'll touch on some others tonight too. Some exciting new, new technologies. Um, so what we're gonna do here is uh, talk a little bit about uh, staircasing and full threshold. Um, we have to remember that the staircase strategy that changes our light, it's going to change it in uh, four decibels until the light's not seen, and then it'll increase it by two decibels until it's seen again. Uh, approximately 18 to 20 minutes for uh, test time per eye with a full threshold. Um, Humphrey will say that it is uh, 10 minutes if it is um, a young patient in a normal visual field. And, you know, but most of our patients aren't in that bracket and these thresholds take a long time. Stat pack, which you'll see is the, the software statistical analysis package available um, in the threshold for a 24-2 or a 30-2 uh, test and uh, CETA as well. And that's going to be what helps interpret your data. Stat pack is like your statistical analysis, your data interpretation. And this database is the average of the second and third visual fields for age-adjusted norm uh, patients. 
glaucoma hemifield and change probability, um, that's also included in the statistical analysis in the stat pack. And that is really helpful once you have a series of fields to uh, look and see, um, you know, two, if we're getting a change in uh, the superior and inferior uh, fields and looking for asymmetry between the superior and inferior. So all of that's in there. So alternative um, to a full threshold strategy would be doing the fast pack. Um, it changes the light by three decibels to try to speed up the test and it doesn't recross the threshold. So it does decrease the test time by 40%, but it's really not as precise. And because we now have C to fast and C to faster, um, we really aren't really using the fast pack. I mention it, um, but you know, so, so you know what it is, but we really aren't doing that much. The stat pack data is not really available with fast pack. So when we talk about full threshold, it really is the gold standard. It's the longest test, the 30-2. 76 points are tested in the central, 30 degrees, tested six degrees apart. Oftentimes the edge points are depressed and we don't really wanna look at all the edge points in the printout, especially they're prone to trial frame rings and uh, I, I don't even count those if, if those are missed. Um, and really the 30-2 is really used for non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy and neurology testing. So patients that have strokes, multiple sclerosis, they've got optic disc drusen, uh, we're looking for uh, any type of pituitary tumor, vertical midline defects, we're always running a full threshold 30-2. 24-2 is a subset of the full threshold. It's a 54 point subset of the points in the 30-2 with less testing time. But the downside is it might not pick up the progression as quickly because you're testing less points. Um, it, it's just not used quite as frequently because of that. 10-2 we do use quite a bit. 10-2 um, is gonna test that 68 points in the central 10 degrees, uh, two degrees apart. And it's really the preferred test for end-stage glaucoma, as well as to monitor central vision. And studies now have shown that we are seeing more macular involvement uh, occurring earlier than previously thought in glaucoma. Um, and we are trying to throw in those 10-2 tests uh, occasionally, just to try to make sure we are getting all of those points tested. You know, the macula does represent about 2% of the retinal area, but it does contain more than 30% of the retinal ganglion cells. So early glaucoma, we're getting these comma-like defects that often appear in the macular region. And, you know, the 10-2 really is underutilized in all stages of glaucoma. So it's good sometimes to kind of throw this in, maybe on a day you do an OCT or a stereo disc photo, maybe get a baseline 10-2. And then, you know, continue with your, your normal 24-2s. So what CETA does, this is the one that's the most common, is it gathers the same info as the full threshold 24-2 or 30-2, but faster. Because what it does, it's smart. It tests close to the expected threshold. It knows what the expected threshold should be it's gonna start bracketing much closer to that. So the knowledge of those different points influence outcomes of the other points and the test can pick up and move quicker. So you know, this dates constantly throughout the testing and the initial stimulus is presented at a level where just about half the patients that are nor you know, of normal should be able to see it. Um, and it does not cross the threshold twice to get that final value. So it's much faster and much easier and more patient friendly than the previous uh, algorithms and the longer tests. All right, so CETA fast uh, was developed uh, after CETA and it is twice as fast as CETA, about two to five minutes per eye on a normal. And the stimuli are, uh, that are presented are really just subtly visible. You need to be a little bit more experienced and a, or a younger patient to take it. Um, it's a little less accurate, accurate than CETA standard, but it is faster. 
And I have to admit that we do a lot of CETA fast in my glaucoma practice. Um, CETA standard is great. We do a lot of that. That's really the gold standard, but many patients just can't do the, the length of those tests and, and the tests become more unreliable. So CETA fast is a really good alternative and works very well. A few years ago, uh, they developed uh, CETA faster with the Humphrey Field Analyzer 3 on that machine the newer machine, and it was designed to shorten the test time and improve the accuracy um, by kind of modifying and getting seven improvements over the CETA standard. It's a little less precise. Um, you know, the CETA FAST is less precise than the CETA standard, um, but the differences were small and same with the, the FASTER. Um, the CETA FASTER, it was concluded, could basically replace the CETA FAST um, because those results were very similar. And it, you know, it shouldn't replace the CETA standard. Again, that's the gold standard in glaucoma and, and in field testing. But if you need a shorter test, then you can feel confident in using this. We also have used swap perimetry in the past. And this, if you remember, uses a size five blue stimulus on the yellow background. And it's thought that it tests the coniocellular ganglion cells and possibly identify field defects maybe five years earlier than standard automated perimetry. But some of the newer research isn't really confirming that and um, CETA is still thought to be superior. Uh, I used to use this long ago as a tiebreaker, but now with the development of, you know, ERG and VEP testing, um, we have newer technology, uh, but it still has a place and certainly can be helpful. You just have to remember that if you have uh, media opacities like cataracts, they filter out that blue light and may not get good accurate results. I'll mention frequency doubling technology. Many people have the, the FDT matrix. Um, this target stimulates the magnocellular pathway. This is a great portable machine. Uh, it's responsible, you know, the magnocellular pathway for the low contrast, high temporal frequency or motion stimulus detection. The M cell neuron um, is much less numerous than the other types and can be one of the first neurons damaged in glaucoma. So it kind of has this alteration in a high frequency between the light and dark bars. And it kind of gives you that doubling illusion with the cycling uh, for the, the testing with the, the flicker phase. And the matrix version allows for you know, smaller targets um, than the original FDT and incorporates a glaucoma probability change analysis, which is nice. Uh, it does have a screening as well as threshold testing with the FDT matrix. And it takes uh, five minutes, really, regardless if there are any defects present, which is very patient friendly. Um, it does use a ZEST algorithm, uh, so a little bit different uh, statistical analysis, uh, but it, the threshold tests are analyzed very similarly to the standard automated perimetry. So, you know, we now have. Um, some very, very exciting new technology that we want to talk about, uh, the virtual reality testing. Uh, many of you have heard that there is a couple devices out right now, and our sponsors tonight are one of them. And, uh, you know, we've, I can't even tell you, like, even today, I had 10 uh, visual fields on my schedule today. And every single one of those patients you know, they just look at me after the test and I walk in and I say, well, I know, you know, you had your field of vision test today. And, you know, I know you're angry with me for, for scheduling that today. And that's a long test. And, you know, they hate it. They roll their eyes and like, we hate this, this test. Why do you make us do this, Dr. Muckley? Well, now we've got something that is possibly a lot more patient friendly. Um, it is, uh, you know, portable. Uh, it is, doesn't require great fixation. Um, it is much easier. Uh, I'm excited about this. I need to learn a little more about this and practice this and, um, you know, trial this in the office and see, but I'm super excited. Um, future is definitely upon us. Uh, virtual reality, you wear it. It's, you can minimize technician time. Patients can do it in the room by themselves. Many of these devices talk to the patient. And um, think of it kind of like a, a, the new video games. You know, Atari back in the day is like the old perimetry testing and the virtual reality platforms are like your PlayStation and Xbox uh, graphic. Um, it is the same testing protocols as the Humphrey Field Analyzer 
got the 30-2s, the 24-2s, 10-2s, and, and it definitely uh, increases the efficiency and the patient experience. One of the new uh, platforms is called uh, All Eyes, and um, they uh, are uh, out now. Uh, they've got uh, a office-based uh, machine, uh, basically laptop, cloud-based, and then they also have a device that allows uh, home monitoring of patients through the uh, office machine. Um, the st studies are showing excellent correlation between the, the visual and the standard automated perimetry. And that's also not only in normal patients, but in glaucoma patients. And the All Eyes was validated, studied by Dr. Jay Katz and the Wills Eye Institute, as well as Vanderbilt and the University of Alabama, Birmingham. The study was published in the Journal of Glaucoma and uh, the correlation was found to be excellent. Uh, so this is exciting. Uh, All Eyes also has theatric perimetry, which is something different. Uh, visual acuity near and far. It can measure color vision as well as contrast sensitivity. We also have the Hero. The Hero is um, the also a virtual reality uh, visual field testing. Uh, the study and the research has been done out of Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, uh, developed by the physician researchers there and the investors. Uh, it's really a, a cool machine because pupil tracking called the active track is tracking the eye of the patient. So if the patient looks away, the test is only delivered when the patient is looking back at fixation where they should be looking. So you're not going to have a ton of fixation losses. You don't have to have that uh, to monitor the fixation and have that, you know, tracking gaze tracking uh, like you had with the standard automated perimetry. Uh, it starts with the screener and it converts to threshold if the defect is detected on a screening. So it automatically just switches to a threshold test if it picks up a defect on the screening mode. Uh, it presents the stimuli at infinity, so you don't have to calculate their near correction. And uh, you can use a spherical equivalent uh, lens uh, to correct their distance vision. So no uh, astigmatism, you just do a spherical equivalent. It too has color vision and contrast sensitivity testing, as well as dark adaptation uh, testing. And the results also were comparable to the Humphrey with good correlation. And what I was excited about with this is that the printout is very similar to what you're used to seeing with the Humphrey uh, standard automated perimeter. This is exciting and we, you know, we'll see. Um, it looks super promising. Um, my office is going to be involved in a study uh, looking at correlation uh, between uh, the Humphrey and uh, the, the test, the HERU, and as well as moderate, mild, and advanced glaucoma field defects. Uh, will it replace the Humphrey CETA standard or CETA fast for glaucoma? I don't know. Um, we'll see. Uh, right now, it's uh, the technology is early. There's not a progression analysis yet available for virtual, virtual reality devices, but I know that is in the works. So let's uh, talk a little bit about some tips for test selection. Uh, you should not mix a 24-2 and a 30-2. Uh, you have to kind of stick with one. They're not interchangeable as far as interpretation. You're kind of reestablishing a new baseline if you uh, have to switch between the two because the sensitivities uh, are different with the shorter test and you can't compare them. You want to keep the testing strategy and type to the same to ensure that repeatability. Shorter tests kind of look better. And there could be a one to two decibel change, which can be significant. So you, you, it's not comparing apples to apples. And remember the standard six degree space of testing is not useful for monitoring uh, visual field near fixation. So improved resolution of a 10-2 test can detect that scotoma in that central 10 degrees that would be missed typically on a 30-2 or 24-2. Okay. So let's talk stimulus. So decibel value for a Humphrey perimeter, you know, refers to that stimulus intensity, and it is a logmar relationship with apostilles. So zero decibels is the maximum brightest perimeter produces 10,000 apostilles. 51 decibels is the dimmest, which is a 0.08 apostille. 
So basically most normal people with normal, I shouldn't say normal people, normal visual fields, people with normal visual fields um, can see about 40 decibels as the dimmest. Um, so that's kind of what is considered norm. So, you know, zero is bright. 51 is the absolute dimmest that you can detect and 40 is about average. So the Humphrey field uh, has one to five stimuli and the size three white stimulus is pretty standard and used uh, in patients with visual acuity. So when you're running the test, you usually pick the stimulus three unless patients have severe decreased acuity, uh, advanced glaucoma where, you know, it is 2100, 2200, um, maybe some macular degeneration, then you want to go with a size five bigger stimulus. One, two, and four are rarely used. So I usually either use three or I use five. And if I have to use five, most likely I'm switching sometimes to a 10-2 no matter what. So pupil size needs to be consistent also uh, when we're looking at tests. So you have to choose, am I going to run these fields undilated or dilated? How's that going to fit into my workflow? Either way is okay. Um, but you don't want pupils to be any smaller than two millimeters or really any larger than six, because that could influence the testing outcome and cause you to have some artifacts in your testing. So however your workflow is and, and where you want to fit it in, either stick with all dilated or all non-dilated fields. And you have to definitely have the refractive error corrected and calculated appropriately. So if you have a, a staff assistant, a para-optometric or a technician doing your field testing, you want to make sure you know, that they are typing in and you have an updated manifest refraction and uh, they're putting that in the machine and getting the, the refractive error and correcting the astigmatism. You need to watch for the trial frame rings and making sure that you know, that's up against their eye. And AFAKES and high myopes, it's better if they just wear a contact lens and not use those thick trial rings because you will absolutely get artifacts, especially in high plus. All right, well, let's talk about the stat pack um, analysis. It's a, you know, the stat pack, like I said earlier, is the st statistical analysis package of the operating system. Uh, single field printout is basically giving you the comparison of your single threshold test with an age-related normative database. And it's gonna show you the abnormalities from that normative database. GPA is also part of the stat pack. That's the guided progression analysis. That's gonna compare the changes between baseline and follow-up tests. And this GPA was developed for use in the EMGT uh, landmark glaucoma trial. And it basically is taking uh, test taking data that was collected in 16 trial centers and it established a normal rate of test to test variability between visual fields. And then it looks for those outliers where that's just not normal variability, that's actually progression. So let's talk a little bit about the GPA. Only CETA can usually can be chosen initially for GPA analysis. So if you're going to use the GPA, you're going to be doing all CETA, which you pretty much should be doing anyway. And you can mix any combination of CETA standard, CETA fast, or CETA faster to create the GPA analysis. So let's say, you know, years ago, you started with CETA standard, but then you switched to CETA faster. It's going to use all of those tests to create that, that GPA analysis. Um, the new uh, field analyzer three will automatically choose the two oldest compatible tests to be the baseline. And um, otherwise you can also have your uh, technician or staff member or you choose which tests you want to use as the baselines. So tests displaying high false positives greater than 15% are gonna be automatically excluded by default from the GPA analysis. So if the test is unreliable because of false positives, you're not gonna get a GPA printout. So even if you have five tests and four of them or three of them have you know, high false positives, you won't be able to get a GPA from that. Um, it's important to, to remember that you can manually change these baselines to exclude bad tests. So you know, that's important in uh, making sure that you're using reliable tests and um, getting that accurate progression analysis. 
So basically, you choose your baseline, uh, and the program then will compare each future field to the baseline. It will flag the points as possible progression if you see the same three test points are abnormal compared to the database on two consecutive visual fields. And then it'll give you probable or likely progression if those same three test points are abnormal on three examinations. So the triangles are going to show you down the bottom of the printout uh, whether or not it's two or three, you know, likely, possible, and then likely progression. Now, one caveat to remember and some tips when you're using the GPA is from time to time, you do have to rebaseline a patient. Uh, if you change treatment, let's say you found a progression and you think your, your patient is progressing and the, the GPA is saying likely progression, possible progression, and you want to intervene and you re- uh, set your target IOP 20 to 30 percent lower from where they currently are. Well, now that's going to be a new baseline because you changed treatment. Or let's say a patient had a TRAB or had SLT or something um, that you know you changed course. Well, now you kind of have to select the baselines with the newer fields. Otherwise, it's going to keep looking like it's progressing. But you've already intervened. The machine doesn't know you've intervened. So please do not forget to rebaseline a patient if you have changed your therapy. Um, the GPA really does save time. You know, I'm so used to in the past looking at every field, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, and looking at that series and doing a point by point comparison. Well, the GPA kind of does that for you. So it really helps you look at the points that possibly could be progressing. And, you know, there's some variability. People can shift fixation, you know, things shift a little bit, but you can really tell when something is legitimately progressing. And it's just kind of another tool to use to help you identify progression, but you, you do have to clinically correlate everything. You need to look at the nerve, you need to look at the OCT, you need to make sure that this is making sense. Um, so please always correlate your findings. No one ever relies on just one test in glaucoma. Okay, so let's talk and switch gears just a little bit to kind of understanding the printout. We're going to talk a little bit about what is in the printout and what's important in the printout. Uh, we have reliability indices. We have the, you know, to talk about what's a common pattern, looking at the probability values, um, the deviations, the glaucoma hemi field, and a little bit more with the GPA. So the thing that um, you know, I think is super important and the first thing you should be looking at are the reliability indices when analyzing the printouts and the testing. So high amounts of fixation losses and false positives and negatives um, can really cause a test to be unreliable and not interpretable. You wanna pretty much see less than 15% for false positives and false negatives. And fixation losses are going to possibly mask defects. False negatives can indicate falling asleep at the wheel. But we see a lot of false negatives, though, in advanced glaucoma. You have to be careful about that. Um, and remember, a false negative is defined as you don't see uh, a response from the patient to a light nine decibels brighter than was what was previously seen at the same point. So they had seen it, they clicked on it, and then it was shown to them again, um, nine decibels brighter, and they did not click on it. False positives are your trigger happy patients, and they're going to see a stimulus that wasn't presented. And oftentimes you will see those 40 decibel or higher um, uh, you know, values. And uh, you remember, uh, you know, most older people have normal decibels around 30. So, you know, you start getting up there, you're going to uh, realize that that's not normal. Okay. So pattern deviation is the next thing I kind of like to look at because this is, I think, one of the more important uh, indices to help us look, see where is there really a true defect. The total deviation is going to show the decibel deviations from norm, but the pattern deviation is going to filter out any generalized depressions like cataracts or uh, other media opacities. And I think really this is the most important 
that PAC analysis when you suspect glaucoma. You wanna be looking at this pattern deviation and does it make sense? Does this correlate with your OCT? Does this correlate with your optic nerve presentation? Is there a notch at six o'clock? And do we have a superior defect that corresponds to that? So those are the things you wanna keep in mind. Grayscale, I mean, it's, it's, that's the impressive picture. Um, you, you can't help but look at it. Um, it's really a good patient education tool it really should just be looked as as a first look. So you kind of, you know, see the overall pattern, but you really want to look at the, the deviation, the, the total and the pattern. And remember, it, it, it can present a, a, with profound loss and show that, um, but it, it's more just of an education tool because a lot of the points are extrapolated and not really compared to a lot of the normal ranges. All right, so let's talk a little bit more on the glaucoma hemifield. Um, like I said earlier, this is your symmetry from the inferior and superior part of the field. It compares points in the upper field to the corresponding points in the lower field. And we should have symmetry in a normal field. Um, you know, the, the test is gonna be considered outside normal limits. And it's gonna show that if you're seeing that the upper and lower fields are differing by an amount found in less than 1% of normals. It's gonna give you a borderline reading if the difference is found in one to 3% of normals. And then it'll give you a within normal limits if there's no abnormalities. So this is a key feature of potential glaucoma and should be looked at uh, in detail as well. Global indices, um, this kind of gives us a numerical qualification a quantification in decibels of just how much visual field loss you have. Um, a good rule of thumb is a normal value for the mean deviation of the, of the test is above a negative two. Uh, moderate to, uh, you know, more high, higher moderate glaucoma would be a mean deviation with the range of negative six decibels to negative 12. So when you're looking at this number and you're seeing mean deviation, if you're really above a negative two, uh, that is a red flag for uh, glaucoma and abnormal fields. Um, it does not take into account cataract progression, so keep that in mind. Um, and you know the pattern standard deviation is really more localized, and that still is is the main um, uh, indice. Okay, so this is a, what the printout will look like. And um, Zeiss has this on their website. And I think this is super helpful. Um, it's just a nice little tutorial just to kind of remind you of what each section is giving you and you know what you're looking at in each point and what the standards mean. We kind of just went over that, but this is where, where everything is. If you have enough field of visions, get a GPA analysis, it'll be right here. And you'll get to see whether or not these points are showing, um, you know, likely progression or, um, you know, possible progression. So this is uh, kind of a box within the, the, the printout. So what constitutes uh, the criteria for an abnormal field in glaucoma? So any one of the three criteria present below in a repeatable test, now the OAT study says three repeatable tests, but basically in a repeatable test, any of these three count as an abnormal field and could be flagged for glaucoma. Cluster of three contiguous points on the same side of the horizontal meridian with a P less than 5%, with one at a P less than 1% in the pattern deviation plot. Where your glaucoma hemifield test reads outside normal limits, and where you have a pattern standard deviation where P is less than 5%. So that's the clustering of change among adjacent data points. You know, you get those, those points that are clustered together. That is a, a sign of possible progression or an early start of glaucoma. Progression constitutes a deepening of an existing defect an enlargement of an existing defect or an appearance of a new de defect in what was previously considered normal. Those are your, your definitions of what progression really is. So some tips here for kind of figuring out progression. You wanna ask, are the tests reliable? 
That's first and foremost. You need to make sure tests are repeatable and that the tests are reliable. Otherwise, it can kind of throw off your, your treatment. It can make a field look better or worse than what it really is. You want to look at the pattern deviation plots and compare those. And you want to check the threshold values and see which points are better and which are worse. And is there a trend? Um, you can do a point by point comparison. And repeatability, are the, the defects, are they repeatable? Are they deepening? Are they present on at least two fields? Um, those, are, those are red flags for kind of looking at progression. And, you know, what are the defects we're looking for? Well, as I mentioned, you know, in the first slide, you're kind of looking for defects in that germ area, it follows that arcuate course from the optic nerve ending at the, the temporal uh, raft. And early defects are going to be small localized areas. Most of it is early, very early nasal step. Sometimes that can be misinterpreted from a trial frame ring, or even um, we've been getting a lot of mask, COVID mask interference on these glaucoma tests. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the frustration I've had with that. Um, but a very, very early, most common field defect in glaucoma is that nasal step. If you have the capability with your EHR system, I like to put up both the right and left visual fields, but do it like the patient is seeing. So I like the left field on the left and the right field on the right. And that way I know that this is the patient's view. And I show the patient that because they oftentimes don't realize that they have scotomas, the opposite eye covers for them. And it can be very educational and almost a little shocking for some patients to see, you know, where they have this blind spot and they're not even aware of it. And when they see the repeatability of it and they see that it's showing up on every single test, they really know that their glaucoma is real. And it's very difficult to tell a patient, you know, you have glaucoma, it's an asymptomatic disease. They don't see this blind spot at this point. And by the time they would see the blind spot, you know, we've lost, you know, 30, per, you know, 30 million, uh, you know, axons. So it, it is really helpful to show your patients their, their visual fields. Types, other types that you tend to see, um, arcuate nasal step will progress to an arcuate scotoma. Uh, you can get a altitudinal defect in advanced glaucoma. Temporal wedges are a little more rare, but you can get those and large blind spots. And then the paracentral scotomas are common. You want to definitely run that 10 2 macular test every once in a while and, and see if you're picking up any central loss. Um, and again, Correlate that with the optic nerve damage and your OCTs. Some pitfalls for interpretation, um, osis, dermatochelasis, if you don't manage that, you're gonna wind up with a superior arcuate defect. So tape those lids out of the way, um, you know, really look at your patient and um, tell your technicians that if the lid droop is there, gotta tape them up. Trial lens rims, uh, make sure that you uh, have that up against the patient's eye and uh, patients that are really trigger happy and if they're asleep at the wheel, they're gonna have that clover leaf pattern and then the COVID masks. So I've had a lot of inferior defects that you think are inferior arcuate defects, but they're the mask. So these last couple of years, I've asked my patients if I thought I had a, a progression in the inferior field, come back, repeat the test and pull the mask off the nose and or just take the mask off altogether and look for repeatability. A lot of times it's going away. There is a ton of mask interference and no one's wearing their masks the same way. Some of them are really high up, some of them are down. When you're in the chin rest, it's pulling things. So just be very careful of the pitfalls of thinking that you've got progression when really it's the COVID mask. So, um, you know, this is pretty typical, just like I showed you here, nasal step or not. I like to have the fields on the side. And when you take a look here, is this a, na a nasal step? Well, when you repeat the test, it's gone. Um, so you, you, you need to make sure this is not a trial lens ring. We don't like to look at edge points. So nasal step, three contiguous points, usually the same side of the uh, horizontal line. Um, so just make sure that you are uh, ensuring that, you know, you don't misjudge something and that you repeat the test and then boom, it's gone. But now we've got some central loss. So that's your classic field patient, never the same twice. 
All right, so frequency of testing, what's real, um, what's recommended? Um, the World Glaucoma Association, again, is saying three visual fields per year, the first two years after diagnosis. Um, you can detect rapidly progressing eyes, and that's basically two decibels a year of change. Uh, if you feel like you don't have a rapid progressor, you can reduce to uh, an annual test once you establish this. In advanced glaucoma, insurance may cover up to four visual fields a year. And, you know, OCTs are pretty useless in advanced glaucoma. So uh, this is the best way to, to monitor for progression. Um, and in your glaucoma suspects, you know, one test every one to two years might be sufficient depending on what the risk factors are. And, you know, you have to clinically uh, correlate the structure with the function. So don't be afraid to, um, you know, really utilize visual fields. We've got away from it sometimes in suspects. We rely so much on the OCTs. And, you know, don't, don't get tricked with green disease where the overall OCT looks normal. There's just one little area of inferior nerve fiber layer thinning. You really need to do a visual field to see if you're getting a correlated visual field defect. So, you know, I think if I had to, ever, you know, choose, I love the OCT, but I'm old enough to have practiced, you know, 20 years of glaucoma without it. Um, the fields really are important because that's what's looking for functional changes and looking for um, progression, you know, even oftentimes better than an OCT when we have established glaucoma. Make sure you are field testing. All right, let's look at our time. I think I've got just a few minutes. We can maybe get through a, a case here. A 77-year-old Caucasian female diagnosed with moderate low tension glaucoma in 2011. Uh, Pre-treatment pressures were 18 and 19. She was placed on Travitan Z and her pressure goal was set to be around 14 or 15. No progression in the visual fields, but the pressure did creep up over the years. And in 2015, she had SLT on both eyes and um, were off after a couple of years. And then she was subsequently placed on bromonidine in 2018 in both eyes in addition to the Travitan. Compliance, and she does report every four to five months, and her pressure's been holding good around 14. So in 2021, this was her um, OCT. Um, she had you know, routine visual fields and OCT testing all along, all the way through, and her pressures were at 13. But you can see that she pretty much does have more moderate uh, glaucoma, classic inferior, superior defects. Um, we have a smaller optic nerve here, larger optic nerve with corresponding cupping. But the cupping here still is very elongated and more than what even the cupping is in the small nerve. I get nervous about small nerves with large cups, but um, you know we certainly don't want to see vertical elongation and almost a notch into that rim. So here's her uh, field of vision test, um, and this was in 2018. And you can see left eye, we've got a, a moderate inferior arc and that pretty much corresponded to the um, OCT here. And in the right eye, also a little bit of an inferior arc there, but not as much. So the glaucoma is a little more in the left eye compared to the right. So I'm gonna show you her series of left visual fields from 2018 to 2020. So here's the 2018, this was uh, next, field in 2019, her indices were showing a 14% false positive. So the question is, is, is this progressing? Is this not progressing? Is this a reliable test? Is this not a reliable test? Here's 2020. And I thought, uh-oh, you know, we've got, this looks almost similar to this test, but now we've got these points missed here that weren't missed over here. Is this progression? And again, false negative of 14%. Um, and uh, that's not bad, but is this reliable? So I wanted to repeat the test. And when I repeated the test, we missed a few more points. We had worsening reliability. So what do you do? What do you do for a patient like this? So again, we have to kind of clinically correlate things. And you, you know, I think the best thing is, is that this is a real life patient. You're never going to get perfect textbook reliability in visual fields unless, um, you know, you're a monkey in a lab and monkeys are trained better than humans are um, 
in, in visual field testing. So you have to really look at this. And when I looked back at her OCTs, I was concerned that this really is legitimate progression. Um, you know, I felt mm, maybe this field, we had a little deepening of some defects here. And now we've got more. And even though the reliability isn't perfect, she's pretty consistent. I, I doubt this line might be right, um, but I do feel that that was progression. So subsequently I lowered her eye pressure and uh, initiated further pressure lowering uh, in her left eye. Uh, this is another case. I think I got time for one more. Um, this is a case where uh, the patient had narrow angles in 2001 with pressures 24 to 26, uh, mild cupping. She had an LPI. Uh, her goal was set to 18, and she was never really an angle closure, um, more mixed mechanism where, um, you know, the, the angles being a little more narrow certainly wasn't helping the situation, but it did relieve some things. Her pressures creeped up in 2010, and um, because the angle had opened up post LPI, she was able to have an SLT. And then eventually she had cataract surgery, which we all know lowers the eye pressure, especially in someone with more narrow angles. Um, she did have progression in her OCT in uh, 2017, and you can kind of see here her OCTs, and um, especially the left eye. And at that time, it was recommended that, you know, we reassess her pressure goals and try to get her uh, set down to even more towards 14. And over the years, she had difficulty with the drops, um, allergies to bromonidine, dorzolamide, and BAK. Currently, we're on Zelpros uh, with a pressure of 14. So here are her uh, field of vision tests. And you can see that March 19, 2020, 2021, and we had possible right you know, progression in November of 2020 and a most likely repeatable defect in March of 2021 correlating with the previous slide here. So um, you know, this, this is important to look at when we start getting around 68 microns and we start really seeing these quadrants deepen, you want to uh, you know, reassess your pressure lowering and, and institute further further treatment. Um, so I felt that this was definitely repeatable. It wasn't exactly like this. It certainly was deeper than what her field test was in 2019. And the reliability uh, indices were really, really good. So we ended up uh, trying to take her down from 14 to 10 or 11. And what are our options in someone who has a lot of allergies and sensitivities? Um, we talked about Timolol Ocudose, which is preservative-free Timolol. We offered to repeat the SLT. We discussed a MIGS procedure. Um, you know, you can do MIGS outside of cataract surgery. Uh, a couple of the procedures are approved, goniotomies, Omni, MP3, and Zen. Can all be done outside of cataract surgery. And then the Darista implant. Um, you know, that's a great option as well. And we still might need Timolol or might need something, but a, a Darista implant might be um, more keeping her at that nice uh, flat diurnal curve. And she elected to repeat SLT. Uh, you know, the Arista implant, I think would have been a good option for her since she had so many drop sensitivities, but she was nervous about having something injected. Um, we're, we all try to work on our uh, uh, words, non-invasive. We, I like to use the word insert, the, a little pellet of medicine into the eye um, just to try to soften that, but she was pretty nervous about that. I think we're out of time. I won't get to my third case, but I just want to remind everybody that visual field testing really is a vital component of the diagnosis and follow-up of glaucoma. It's really important to understand what information the machine is providing so that you can really decide whether this is a real defect or if there's progression and you don't want to, you know, it's all of your, your testing and treatment or all of your treatment on poor data and you need to recognize the strengths and limitations of the testing and make sure you correlate it with uh, your other findings. So um, I know uh, Dr. Sorenzi mentioned before, but uh, Dr. Lou Catania is a icon in, uh, in anterior segment care. And he wrote my textbook back in 1995, and he has decided to do a third edition and added a glaucoma chapter, which I was very honored and proud to help write. 
Um, so all of my little clinical pearls and the visual field testing is in even more detail in this chapter. Um, and it'll be released in fall of 2022 um, for optometrists. So, um, you know, feel free uh, to pick my brain, email me. I'm always happy to answer questions and I certainly appreciate your attention uh, today. So thank you, Dr. Serenzi and thank you audience. Thank you, Dr. Muckley. That was a great presentation. I loved your cases and being able to see, you know, glaucoma in the real world and how it's not always so straightforward.